Philippians 4 and 6, our memory verse, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and su with supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. That means don't get over fretted. Don't get over nervous. Amen. Over anxious about anything. But then he tells us what we can do. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In the book of Luke chapter 2, we're going to start with verse 21. You pray, and uh, let's see what the Lord got for us this morning. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. And then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast pre prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Let us pray. Our Savior and King, Father, we bow our heads in humble appreciation for your word and for our privileged time that we're able to gather together like we are, enjoying Sunday school class and the teaching and being able, God, to come together and have this time of worship now in your word and song and testimony. Thankful, Father, for the way that you've moved in our hearts and lives, not only today, but through this last week and the prayers that you have uh, supplied, uh, you've answered, and we're thankful, Father, for the privilege we have to worship the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, uh, that one Lord we know we can go to regardless what all else is going on in the world. We've got a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Bless your word to our hearts and our lives, each one to feed your Holy Spirit. To know your direction and correction, God, your will to be done today. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray and ask it. And amen. I titled this Waiting on Christmas. And I remember as a young boy and the excitement that grew, we weren't rich uh, by any stretch of the imagination as I grew up. And yet for some reason we had great anticipation uh, for Christmas. And I look back and I know we had a, a orange or a ta tangerine and some uh, nuts in, in the shells and you had to break them and walnuts and uh, hazelnuts and one thing and another and uh, filbert nuts and that was a great time uh, because that was an uh, unusual thing and I remember mom making some uh, puppets for, uh, for the girls and uh, uh, dolls out of old socks that had uh, been past their use and I uh, remember look back on that time and those were joyous times uh, that we had always had plenty to eat uh, always be a big meal on the table and so I look back in, at the anticipation that I had and, and even though I don't know the big reason for such anticipation not a whole lot of gifts and not anything maybe that was 
what would you call it, trendy? Uh, we didn't have any trendy gifts by any means, but they were good times. And I remember back the excitement that we had and trying to go to sleep. And there's one particular time uh, that sticks out on my mind. We lived in a great big apartment building on the east side of Cleveland in the, on Huff Road. You remember Huff Road? I get over there and we were living in that area. It was a, a pretty nice when we moved in. It was a slum when we moved out. But I think about how that uh, we lived there and uh, we have excitement. And I remember going to bed that night and uh, we said, I can't, it was uh, kind of like in the living room and it's on a cot and uh, my family had all gone to bed and I was on the cot and I, mom, and I told mom, I said, mom, I can't sleep. I'm too excited. And she said, well, Santa Claus can't come until you close your eyes and you go to sleep. And so she said, you need to go to sleep. So I closed my eyes. Well, in just a moment or two, I was asleep. I don't remember what I woke up to, the excitement about, but I was excited when I went to bed that night. Amen. Christmas does that. Doesn't it make you excited? Makes you look forward to something. And that's kind of the way uh, that it was with me. And I thought about the uh, uh, wise men, the lessons that we had from them uh, last week and the excitement for Christmas. And everything uh, that involves around the, the Christmas story is an exciting time. And Brother Gary talked about and, uh, uh, the, uh, Elizabeth and uh, Zechariah and the time of, of their getting ready to be the birth of, of John and for him to be the forerunner of Christ and to prepare a way before him and his relationship and her relationship to all of them together. All of that's part of the Christmas story. And it's precious, amen. It's something for us to know. And Luke said he wanted to make sure that he set in order the things that he had heard and who was Theophilus sharing with him. He wanted to set it in order so that the certainty of those things would be known. And so I'm positive of the things that I read in Scripture about the Christmas that's coming in the first couple of book uh, of Matthew and Luke as well, chapters, uh, that these things are what really happened. And so we want to look at the uh, book, look, uh, book of Luke, chapter 2, and get an idea of the sense of the excitement and things that they were a part of at that time. And we read about uh, how the, and when the eight days were accomplished, and so the birth of Jesus is already done. Amen? Yeah, Brother Rick, he's eight days old. And so the birth has already happened. The shepherds have already gone back to the field. Amen? Uh, the wise men at this time have either come or they're real close to coming. Uh, right after the wise men see the baby, they, they're warned of God uh, not to go back to Herod, so they depart to their own country in another way. Herod finds out about it, uh, that they didn't come back. Then he wants to kill all the babies uh, that are two years old and under. And so the wise men come at a different time, but Jesus and Mary and Joseph are still in Bethlehem when the wise men come. And so now we're going to Jerusalem, and it may be that they're still in Bethlehem. I believe that possibly the ability is. And they're still in Bethlehem, and these uh, uh, things are happening that God, as Brother Gary mentioned over and over this morning, says, but God has a plan. Amen. God got a plan. He knows where we are. He knows what's going on in our life. At any particular time, uh, there's nothing taking God by surprise and he's got it all orchestrated uh, so that it's going to fit exactly together at the time God wants it to fit together and we got an old man I don't know how old uh, Simeon is but he's uh, got some years on him and uh, we, we read about him and I've always thought of Simeon as an old man and we read about Anna uh, the prophetess that comes in she's an old woman amen and in fact we read that she might be close to 100 years old or so uh, but Simeon, we don't know his age. But I'm going to say he's probably an older fella, uh, an older gentleman, amen. And we read about the eight days are accomplished for the circumcising of the child. And it was so that on the day of circumcision, when they presented, the parents presented the child uh, to God that they gave him a name then. And so this is the way that the order was unless they jumped the gun and did it earlier. And so the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child. His name was called Jesus. Amen. Amen. And Jesus is going to be His name. Now, that was a name that was picked out by who? Mary? Picked out by Joseph? No, it's picked out by God. Amen. And so the angel came and said to Mary, you're going to have a son and His name shall be called 
Jesus. Amen. Another record for us has his name shall be called Emmanuel. And the word Emmanuel means that God with men. And so, amen, God came in the likeness of man that he might be able to be the perfect sacrifice for man because God as man knows everything that man is going through. So he came to be a God man to be the Savior of the world. That's why Jesus came in the flesh, came lowly, come humble, amen, as a babe, lying in a manger. That's what Jesus did. That was the plan of God that he had. His name was called Jesus. Amen. Salvation. That's what his name means. And yeah, the Joshua is the Hebrew rending of the Greek Jesus. His name shall be called Lord. He's going to be Savior. He's God. He's the great I Am. He is the uh, Christ. He is the Messiah. All of those things we read for us uh, in the Word of God, the Scriptures, tell us that's what His name is going to be. In Luke chapter 1, in fact, and verse 31, it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. But then the next verse said, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, the Son of God. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So he's also going to be called what? King. Amen. And so all these things neatly fit together in the Christmas story. And as we read, we start getting into the message in verse um, 21, which was so named of the angel before it was conceived in the womb. Verse 22. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses was accomplished. Amen. They're in Jerusalem and they're going to be met by an uh, older man and uh, with the days of her purification are come according to the law of Moses. Then verse 23 and 24 are what the law of Moses said. And so uh, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just kind of like we think about Hannah did uh, with little Samuel. Amen. Uh, she brought Samuel, presented him to the Lord. And, and of course, that was after he was weaned. But to present him to the Lord is to show, Lord, I thank you for this, this baby that you've given to me. This instant, it has to be a male baby. Uh, so I thank you, Lord, for this male child that you've given unto me, that his lineage, my, his husband, my husband, his father's lineage would continue. And he's going to be able to carry that name. That's kind of the mindset that they had as they come to Jerusalem to present the baby Jesus before God and not only for the family's sake, but may He be great in Israel. That's the kind of the uh, last part of the uh, things that they say as they present the child. May He be great <coughs> in Israel. Amen. And Jesus was great in Israel. Thank you, man. But he wasn't only great in Israel, he was great in uh, Asia, he was great in Africa, he was great in uh, Britain, he was great in the United States. In fact, there's no greater person in the world than Jesus Christ. His name is great. Go back to uh, Luke chapter 2. <coughs> Is to present him to the Lord. As is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So anybody could afford to present their male child before God. I mean, if you set a snare, you could pre present a little turtle dove or a pigeon. So God is making available your ability to worship Him and to thank Him for the children that have been born unto you. Amen. My three, your seven, and all the children together. Amen. All the eight. All that God has given us, we're able to present them to the Lord and thank God for them. Are not children a blessing from God? Amen. Amen. And that's how Mary and Joseph had to feel as well. They were excited. They're in the part of fulfilling the law of God. They're still worshiping. Amen. Joseph and Mary, the information that they've got and what Jesus is going to be, uh, the wise men, the shepherds, uh, Simeon, and a little bit later on, all these things are building together and they still got a mind to go to the temple according to the religion that they worship God with and to present Him and to worship in a way that God has already shown He is going to honor. Are you worshiping God 
in the way He has shown that He's going to honor. Amen? We need to make sure that our lives, what we do by our lives, the life that we live, the lifestyles that we have, that they're God honoring, that they're pleasing to the Lord, that we're raising our children up in the way that God would have us to raise them up. Amen? Uh, that we do the things that God's Word has spoken to us about, that we raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I do not believe today that we leave that up to the state. I do not believe today that we leave it up to someone else. Amen. That while we can and God has blessed us, we've got the opportunity. We need to raise our children up and to let them understand that God is foremost and ought to be foremost in their life. You're second. Your friends are second. Your husband or your wife is second. But God has to be first. Amen. 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 We need to let them know how important that is so that they get a right sense of priorities to start with. Mary and Joseph were bringing the baby Jesus. They do not have at this time full knowledge. Amen. God has not exposed everything to them. And if He had told them all the words that we have in, in the Gospels, they would still not have all the knowledge. We don't have everything that Jesus said. We don't have everything that Jesus did. We don't have everywhere that Jesus went in the Gospels. Amen? So if God had laid out the whole plan, uh, no doubt some of it would not have taken. Uh, when we went to Israel that first time, our guides seemed like to talk on and on and on, nonstop. Later on, they didn't talk as much. He said, your mind has already been bombarded with so much new information. You're not receiving much of what I say. I believe Mary and Joseph would have been that way. There's only so much that you can take in in a moment. And they were taking it in and little by little as they came to them. And so the time was accomplished. They presented to the Lord according to the law of Moses. Verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem. This man was in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Now I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit and say I believe the man lived in Jerusalem. Simeon was his name. He was a man in Jerusalem. His name, Simeon, means to hear. It means hearing. And so Simeon was hearing from God. Amen. There's a special message in what was going on that applies to Simeon and him being at the place that he was at this particular time that he was. God has a plan. God has a frame of mind and a way of speaking and working things out that it's going to fit exactly like you would have it to be. Simeon is not here by accident. The Holy Ghost of God moved upon him to get them there. Let me extend that a little bit. Now, the Holy Ghost of God has moved upon you to get you to the house of God today so that you might, Simeon, you might hear. Amen. Amen. What the God has got as an instruction for you that you might learn of Him. That you might be blessed from God. Amen. I and mean, you can't get that out in the world. The world's not going to bless you like God is going to bless you. You might be blessed out there and you might have happiness from time to time. But nothing's going to make you happier than Jesus. Nothing's going to bless you more than Jesus. Amen. I find out all the pleasures that the world got for it. They're going to come up. They're going to be extended for a while. And then they're going to be gone. I thank God for what I've got in Jesus. Amen. Uh, that joy and that peace uh, that is in my soul. I think about uh, the woman at the well of Samaria there. Whenever that she left, she left the water pouch. She uh, bucket. Uh, she took uh, Jesus, the water with her. Amen. She went in there and said, let me tell you what's in my heart. A man that I met that told me all things that I'd ever done. Is not this the Christ? Yeah. Amen. Is not this the anointed? Is not this the Messiah? That's the one that we're talking about today. And so, in verse 25, a man named Simeon, and the same man was just. And the, the word just there means righteous. This was not a, a halfway Christian or follower of God. This was not somebody uh, that was a good fellow on Sunday or Saturday uh, for them and then was messed up the rest of the week. This was somebody that loved God on Monday 
as well as he did on Saturday and the rest of the week. Amen? And he was waiting for God. He was intense in anticipating uh, for something, a great move of God. He was excited like I was excited when I was a baby on Huff Avenue, a young child waiting for Jesus, waiting for Christmas to come. Amen? That's the way the word to live. I'm waiting for Jesus to come today, aren't you? Amen. It makes me excited to think about Him coming again. Amen. Kind of like it was when I was a baby on Huff Avenue. I was excited about Christmas and Santa Claus. I'm excited about Jesus coming. Amen. And coming soon. Maybe today. Don't know when He's coming again. But Simeon was a righteous man. He was a just man. And he was devout. He was very pious. He was very godly. That's what that means. And then the next word in there. W-A-I-T-I-N-G. He was waiting. Amen. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on God to have His way in our hearts and our lives. And I'm waiting for God to move upon America. I'm waiting for revival in this country. Praying for it. We're moving forward. Praying and waiting for revival in the church. I'm praying and waiting on Christmas. They still get excited about Christmas. A little bit different now than what it was when I was on Huff Avenue as a child. I'm waiting for uh, Christmas now because of the joy that I see expressed in my family. Amen. And especially as a Christian man and as a Christian family and having most of my family around us that say to know what it means to be ready to meet God. Amen. To have that time to share that joy of Christmas with family. That's what I'm excited about. Amen. And the uh, Mercedes that Deb's gone behind me. I'm kind of excited about that as well. <laughs> but I'm excited about Christmas and it's time coming and all the things uh, that are going to be revealed to us on that particular Christmas Eve or Sunday morning, whichever way you worship enjoy it. <clears throat> and he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. The word consolation means comfort. He's waiting for the comfort of Israel. And if you think about what they were involved in, they had Herod the Great and how bad he was. And Jesus was born somewhere around 4 B.C., uh, four years before he was born. Uh, 4 B.C., that's what that means. Uh, before Christ, B.C., before Christ. So Jesus was born 4 B.C., but the idea there is that we, the calendar we have today, they didn't have back then. So they assumed a date. They got as close as they could. And then when they got the calendar, Gregorian calendar we got, they looked back and they missed it by the four years. So they had to back up. Not going to change the calendar now. So it's back up. And it's four years before zero, the Gregorian calendar. And so Jesus was born 4 B.C. Or in other words, Herod the Great died somewhere around 4 B.C. Now, he may have died 3 B.C. because remember, they're counting up. Two, zero to one, we count farther from that. And so day, year one, supposedly, of the time that Jesus was born would have started out at one. But Herod died somewhere between 4 B.C. and 3 B.C. Shortly after he gave the order to go kill all those babies in, in Bethlehem. Shortly before or after that, he gave that order. And so it's during that time piece that they're under the, the government of Rome. Uh, they are paying taxes to a foreign government. Uh, they've got all these foreign armies of, of Rome around about them. And they've been praying for since the time that God told Moses there's going to be another prophet like unto you that he's going to raise him up. He's going to free my people Israel ever since then, 2,000 years, somewhat before that time, 1400 years, uh, the Bible tells us they began to pray for the comfort of Israel, for their enemies to leave them and let them alone so that they could be self-governing and autonomous. God has told Simeon that to wait for the consolation of Israel, or in other words, wait for the comfort of Israel. And what's going to give them comfort? They're looking for somebody that's going to deliver them and that somebody is going to be the Messiah. The deliverer, the setter freer, amen? Moses gave them the law. Jesus is going to give them grace according to the new covenant. And so he comes, he's waiting for the consolation of Israel, and then the Holy Ghost was upon him. He was anointed, filled up, overshadowed and covered with the Holy Ghost of God. The Spirit of God came on Simeon in a mighty way. In the Old Testament, we read about uh, Saul 
uh, before he became king, after Samuel told him he was going to be king, going to be anointed as king, uh, that the Bible says that he got to the city and there were a school or a college of prophets there. And then Saul did what? He prophesied with the prophets. And so the Holy Ghost came upon Saul. He prophesied. The Holy Ghost comes upon Simeon and brings him to a certain understanding. And it was revealed, verse 26, unto him by the Holy Ghost. Now we talked about Zechariah in the temple burning uh, incense and presenting it to the Lord and seeing the angel. And it must have made him excited. The excitement and waiting for Christmas. It must have made him excited. Yeah. And I'm thinking about it. If somebody had just been filled with the Holy Spirit, it was not an everyday occurrence, and God has anointed him, and he's told him to wait. He's waiting for something, and all of a sudden, he's filled up and he's driven to the temple of God. Something has motivated him to go at that particular time, on that particular day, to the house of God. Now, he may have went at that time every day, I don't know. But something was moving him. The Holy Ghost was upon him. Verse 26, It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Amen? So Simeon knew that Christmas was coming. And it was coming in his lifetime. He was not going to see death until Christ came, until the Messiah came, until the Savior of Israel came. Simeon was not going to taste of death until what God said he was waiting for was fulfilled. Amen. It had to have caused him some joy and peace at that time. And then we he's got to have in his heart uh, that it's not going to be long. He should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The word Christ is another word for Messiah. Amen. So and uh, both those words means the anointed. So they're looking for the anointed deliverer of Israel. And then verse 27. He came by the Spirit. I, I got a little circle a, uh, a circle around uh, came by the Spirit. Those four words. I, I want to stress this morning that that's a good way to be moved. Amen. To have encouragement from God is be moved by the Spirit. We need that today. Amen. And here we've got the undertakings of the way that it happened to Simeon. He was a, a godly man, a just man, a, a pious man, and he was waiting for that God had revealed to him. All of these things kind of tell us about the character that he had and the kind of a mindset that he had about him. And he came by the Spirit. He was moved by the Spirit of God into the temple at this particular time on the Lord's timetable in God's time and God knows exactly where Simeon was and where he needed to be. He moved him in that place and when the parents brought in the child Jesus, they're coming together now to do for him after the custom of the law then took he him up in his arm and blessed God and said. And so they come in together. Simeon sees Mary and Joseph of the baby Jesus and he takes him up in his arm. Don't know that any words were passed. I can imagine that had to have been just a little bit on the strange side for them to have some older fella come up that they did not know, maybe knew his face, did not know him, know anything about him hardly, come up and take the baby out of Mary's arm or Joseph's arms or in a carriage or whatever they have, and take him up in his arms. And when he did, he began to bless God. Simeon taking the baby Jesus up did what? He blessed God or he thanked God for what he was waiting for has finally come. Amen. What he's waiting for has finally come. Now the same joy that he had at this first advent, first coming of Christ is the joy that we ought to be having as we look forward to Jesus coming again in the clouds. Amen. For the rapture, for the return of Jesus Christ. It ought to give us joy and anticipation as we wait for that happening to come about. Don't know when it's going to be, kind of like Israel, waiting on the Messiah. But if we believe God's Word, like Simeon believed God's Word, we're waiting for it. We're living in expectation of it. So this is where we're at. He may come today. He may come tomorrow. But without any shadow of a doubt in my mind, Jesus is coming again. Amen. He took him up his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now let us 
thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. He said, I wouldn't taste of death until I saw the Messiah, until I saw the Lord's Christ. This is him. Now Luke said in order the things that were certainly known among them. And so this old man, Simeon, is saying, hey, this is of a certainty what I've been waiting on. This is of a certainty the one that I was looking forward to. He's here. Now I can close my eyes in death and I can go to God. Amen. I bet he would uh, not taste of death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Verse 30. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. My eyes have seen thy salvation. I didn't hear it from someone else. Didn't hear it from Anna. I didn't hear it from uh, a cousin of Jesus. John the Baptist. Didn't hear it from any of those people. I saw the fulfillment of your word right here in my arms. Amen. Right there in his hand. He saw the fulfillment of God. God's still true to his word, church. Amen. God's still true to His Word. He's not let any part of it fall uh, other than the things that haven't happened yet. And those things are going to be just exactly like you said. If it hasn't been fulfilled yet in the Word of God, it's still coming. But everything He prophesied about, about Jesus and His coming, every bit of that's been fulfilled uh, as far as His coming is concerned. Nobody else has ever fit the bill like Jesus has accomplished the Word of God. He said, so I can now close my eyes in death and I can go home to be with the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 52. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 52, verse 9 and 10. This verse is a reference back to what we just experienced. Let thy servant now depart, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Verse 9 said, Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted, consolation, His people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. Jesus is the Savior who redeems. The Lord hath made bare, meaning shown, revealed, His holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Simeon saw it firsthand when Jesus was born and presented to God in the temple. And then he goes on to say in verse 31 of Luke chapter 2, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, making a reference back now to chapter 52 Isaiah that I just read, which hath prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel, not just for the Jews, but it's mentioned specifically, isn't it? Look at that. Isn't that kind of amazing? Here that a Jewish man named Simeon who's been waiting for the consolation of who? Israel now sent a light to lighten the Gentile and the glory of thy people Israel. Also in chapter 42 of the book of Isaiah and verse 6, he said, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold mine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people a light for a light of the Gentiles. God's plan in bringing Jesus to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, 4 B.C., was to make it available for you and I to be saved. Amen. Beautiful story, the Christmas story. Yes. The lights, the tinsel, the trees, the presents, the star on the top of the tree. Every bit of Christmas, every bit of Christmas speaks to me of Jesus. I thank God for my Judeo-Christian heritage. I thank God to be raised in the United States of America. And in the time period that I was raised in, when, when we had morals, we people that were expected to live in a certain way and to present themselves in a certain manner and to carry out their business in a certain ethical attitude, amen, and the things and the ways that they are and all this stuff like that. And I thank God that we are able to celebrate Christmas in America like we did if we still want to, where the tree, which uh, Evergreen speaks of it, pointing to God and always the same, the star on the top, the wise men follow the presence and the decorations, every bit of that is a gift and the glory and beauty of Jesus. I see absolutely everything about it, my friend, pointing to Jesus Christ. All of it is glorious 
Then he says, Therefore mine eyes have seen thy salvation. A light is a light in the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. In verse 33, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of Jesus, which were spoken of Him. Amen. They marveled at what Simeon had just said, taking him up in his arms and looked up to heaven and he blessed God for God's salvation plan. For that God had presented Jesus to the world as He presented to God in the temple. And so they marveled at they really wondered. They didn't, they, although they understood the words, they didn't understand the, the, the value, the depth of those words, the heaviness of those words that were spoken unto them. And then look at verse 34. And this makes me think maybe that Joseph was soon going to be out of the picture somewhere. I don't know when Joseph died. I don't know how old he was at this particular time. But he was quite a bit older than, than Mary was. And it may be that Joseph died not very long after we read about this. So There's a little bit uh, 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 more about Joseph, but not a whole lot. But look at what Simeon says to who? Mary. Why didn't he say it to both of them? Because Joseph wasn't going to be around when these things were fulfilled. Look at it. And Simeon blessed. There's that word again. Thank God. He was happy. And so the word idea there, blessed, blessed means happy words. Words of joy and words of comfort. And so Simeon blessed them, both of them together, and Jesus, and said unto Mary, his mother. That's when all the joy stopped. What's when all of the consolation and happy words, the blessing, took a twist. I mean, Mary knew not very long after what his birth was, and the angel telling all of that, that these things, you keep these in your mind, and little by little you do what? You start to understand them, don't you? You get a further or greater understanding. Now Mary and Joseph already had a certain amount of understanding. This baby that will be born in you, it overshadowed by the Holy Ghost, is going to be the Son of the Highest. It's going to be God's Son. So he took that in. Didn't understand it fully. Amen. Uh, Mary maybe was quite a bit more into that. I didn't know a man. I've had a child. God, this is God's child. She's making that connection. But then something happens. Though this child is sent for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. Back to Luke chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17. <laughs> and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to learn the hearts, to turn the hearts of the fathers to, uh, to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so that's what John the Baptist, according to the angel, told Zacharias was going to happen. And here's the fulfillment of that verse of, of Scripture. Behold, the child is sent for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. Fall into sin. That's what's going to fall. Amen. You fall in this world spiritually. You're falling into sin. If you're rising, you're rising out of sin. Amen. Kind of like baptism. You lay down an old sinner. You get up as a new Christian. That's what baptism shows. And so he said here, the child is sent for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. A sign that shall be spoken against. Uh, amen. Jesus is the sign of God's judgment that shall be spoken again. Spoken against by who? The priesthood. The high priesthood. And all the other little priests. Uh, the, the Sadducees. And the Pharisees. And all of the money changers. And the temple. Everybody that had a part in making a living by the law. By the Old Testament. They're going to find that everything... They're going to have their apple cart turned over. Amen. Everything's going to change. You've been worshiping God as an idol for many years. Now you're going to be called to hand. John the Baptist said the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Meaning you stubble. You trees that were left out of the Old Testament still going the same way. God is going to bring you down. You've got to fall. That's 
That's what he's saying. For a sign which shall be spoken against. That's not too bad yet though, is it? I mean, if you're a Pharisee or Sadducee, a priest or something like that, it might be, well, I don't want to hear that. But look at the rest part. It gets a little bit more personal, doesn't it? Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Now, in this barbarous time, Mary and Joseph had probably already seen crucifixion. Jesus was not the first person crucified. But now he's making a, a parallel to the way she's going to feel emotionally to what is going to happen to her son in crucifixion. A, a sword is going to pierce through thy soul also. So she's not like the priest and the Sadducees that's going to be unhappy. She, she's also going to experience a certain great amount of sorrow. It's going to pierce thy soul. Well, so what was it like to see somebody stuck with a sword? I have no doubt uh, that as that time frame and that living in Jerusalem and around that area and coming to worship, they, Mary and Joseph had to have seen people die by barbarous hands of the Romans. I mean, they would kill people for no reason at all. And then they had people that they killed because they broke the law of Caesar. And so they saw, no doubt in my mind, that they saw this. So, they, so Mary knows what's being said here that it's going to be something personal to, to her by this child. Something's going to happen to my baby that's going to tear the literal heart out of me. So she's, she's got all this going on now. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Great sorrow that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. A sword shall pierce through thy, thy own soul also. And really get to you. I think about the folks that are going through real hard times right now uh, in, in Gatlinburg and around that area. The loss of life and loss of home and every possession, many of them, every possession that they had, some businesses, their livelihood, lost every bit of that. So they've got a sword that's pierced their heart as they go through this time and experience this time and how hard it must be. And the angel has told Mary these good news and things. Simeon comes in and says, all of this is great. But here's some bad news I've got to share with you. We fail to appreciate Christmas if we fail to understand Jesus came to die. Amen. He came to give His life as a ransom for sin. Jesus came as God to live as a man in this world to know what you and I face. To know the hunger, thirst, heat, cold, tiredness, to have friends and family betray you. I mean, Jesus' own brothers didn't think He was the Messiah for a long time. Amen? Now, they didn't draw near to Him like the disciples that were influenced by the Holy Spirit. Later on, we read of them writing things in the Scriptures. Amen? So they came in. But His own family turned against Him for a while. And some of His own family thought He was mad. We fail to appreciate Christmas if we don't connect it to Easter. I read a book uh, and it was about the, uh, the years and it placed a, a number on the greatest days. Uh, Earth's greatest day, Jesus' greatest day. I don't remember the, the title real good. But what it was, it started with one and had kind of a me mediocre thing. and started to and it built up and it got built up. And I think Easter uh, was the, uh, we're pretty close to the top if not the top. And then we've got the ascension, and then we've got him going to heaven, we've got uh, the rapture, and then we've got him coming again. And so uh, here, here's the thing uh, that I want to make mention of this. What was Jesus' greatest day? Every one of them. Because there's nothing he did that was not pointed to the fact that he came. And every bit of his life is for our purpose, our understanding, our knowledge. Amen. I can't make Christmas greater than Easter. I can't make Easter greater than His death, burial, and resurrection. I can't make Easter greater than the rapture. I can't make any of that greater His coming. All of that fits together as one plan of God. God's perfect plan. 
And you read about the joy, the waiting, and the anticipation they had. And I want to share that with you and help you to, to get a grasp of that and understand that. That that joy of what the Christmas first meant. The gifts that the wise men had. The baby being lonely and humble and born in a manger. Placed in a manger, amen. But in a stable. And you think about all of that. What a beautiful story that it is. Attach that to the death, burial, and resurrection. Because it all goes together. Amen. amen. It all works together. So are you excited about Christmas? Are you excited about the Lord's return? Are you excited about living in heaven and having all of your sorrows and all your trouble and all your safe family gather around you that you can experience the joy and the peace and satisfaction that God said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you, but let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Amen. That's what he said. And that's the joy of Christmas. I'm waiting for Christmas. So I think about uh, the kids and the excitement of it and Santa Claus and all of that stuff. We need to <coughs> share with them the reason of the season, the birth of Jesus Christ, which was meaning that that baby came to be your Savior. I love the song, Mary, Did You Know? Amen? It kind of makes a little bit of a connection to all of that, doesn't it? Uh, that baby that you're holding is going to uh, steal the water. He's going to calm the wind. He's going to raise the dead. He's going to touch the eyes of the blind. Amen. That little baby that you kiss, that's God. Amen. That little baby is going to be the ruler of the world. I mean, we all want our babies to be great and famous. I just want them all to be saved. Amen. Amen. That would make them great and famous in my eyes. Let me think about that. My grandkids. But uh, amen, we, we want uh, great things for our children to be able to have a happy life and a joyful life and to be at peace with their life. And the only way I know that will ever happen is that they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. Regardless what, what job you have. Went to school, elementary school in Garfield Heights, Ohio, uh, with a uh, girl. And I didn't know it for a long time uh, that uh, she was rather, uh, to me, well-dressed. And she had a nice watch on her, on her on her wrist. And I said, "Well, what does your dad do?" She said, "My dad's a garbage collector. He he worked for the city a garbage department. Went around in a garbage truck picking up. Said your dad's a garbage collector. And you have those things that just didn't fit with me. And a, a job like that and still have all those things. Here's my point." Jesus Christ is able to make whatever you have, whatever's going on in your life, the best thing that it could be. But we need to get the mind of Christ centered in and focus on Him. Amen. Our Savior, our God, our soon coming King, the Lord of our lives. As we stand, get an invitation number. <clears throat>